It is a joy. It is a gift. It is a blessing to be able to come together to stand in the presence of God wherever we are. For the scripture does tell us that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them also. And what a shame it would be if our only connection to God was based on proximity. So it's a great thing that no matter where we are and no matter what it is we are going through in life, we can still be connected to one another because uh, our connection to one another is based upon our connection to God. Our connection to God is not based on proximity because the Bible tells us that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So not only is God a spirit, but the Bible tells us emphatically that when God made us, he reached down, kneeled down from heaven, if you will, and he breathed into our bodies the breath of life. So what God breathed in you and what God breathed in me was spirit. And there is in you and I a longing for our spirit to be connected to God. So we're connected to God through the spirit and we're connected to one another by a spirit. Um, since we've uh, been separated from one another, we looked at a couple of messages. One message uh, that we uh, were looking at before we separated was a, a series entitled Lessons from Elijah. And uh, after our series of Lessons from Elijah, we began to look at Elijah as he has passed the baton to his uh, 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 successor in the person of Elisha. And so we're going to continue our series of studies to see what are some of the things that we can learn from Elisha as we looked at lessons from Elisha. And if you're not familiar with a couple of these lessons or the series thereof, as, as Pastor Leonard spoke of, you can go to our website as it's uh, newly updated, but you can look at some of those previous sermons and sort of be caught up to speed with where we are. So we were looking here with Elisha, and one of the things that we're going to see is that Elisha as he starts his ministry is going to encounter some obstacles in ministry. And as we started to look at lessons from Elisha, we, we had a couple of doctrinal points or some things that we learned by looking at Elisha. And one of the things that Elisha does is he finds himself uh, engulfed in ministry almost all of a sudden because Elijah is taken away into a whirlwind and the thing that we find is that God prepared him to lead in ministry. Some of the points that we made is that God will not uh, put you in positions or situations that he has not prepared you for. So sometimes we just have to tap into the things that God has done in our lives previously that have prepared us for where we are right now. And then know this, that when you are where God places you, you're going to be challenged and you're going to be challenged in new ways. And hopefully the ways that you are challenged, you'll find them as being exciting. Also, we have found ourselves in places where we just have to make a decision. And when God puts you in position to make a decision, make a decision, stick with it. We talked about the fact that God will confirm 
your heart. He will confirm your appointment, confirm where you are and where you are supposed to be in life. And then uh, the thing that we know about all of life, but especially leadership, is there is discomfort and there are times when you're not going to be so sure. Leadership and all of life comes with unpleasant moments. And those are things that uh, Elisha has found himself dealing with. And he's had to deal with these various issues all of a sudden. This takes us to 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, verse 1 Elisha finds himself meeting with a woman. And this woman is described as being one of the wives of the sons of the prophets. So uh, we talked about the fact that these individuals had schools of prophets that gathered themselves together to learn from and receive instruction and to share in communion and spirit from those prophets who were older. And so now that mantle and that role has fallen to Elisha. So Elisha now has an opportunity to meet a woman that is in distress. Now their cried in verse number one, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet, she came unto Elisha and she said, your servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. So this woman has found herself in sudden calamity. Her husband is dead and now she's left with the responsibility of, of bills. She's left with the responsibilities of creditors and that pushes us to hasten to doctrinal point number one. Being servants of God does not free us from circumstance. Being servants of God does not free us from circumstance. Being servants of God does not uh, free us from life. Being servants of God does not give us an opportunity to be dismissed from everything that everybody else in the world is going through. And so yes, this woman had a husband. Her husband was a God-fearing man. Her husband was a man who lent himself to the service of God. And yet, this woman and her family, her two boys, have found themselves in a position to experience everything that everybody else experiences. And sometimes, uh, we don't do a very good job of preparing our people and, and preaching to our people that, yes, we want you to come to God, we need you to love God, we want you to serve God, but coming to God and loving God and serving God does not uh, uh, make us immune to life. And so we can still suffer heartache and we can still suffer pain and we can still suffer loss, and we can still suffer sickness, and we can still have all of the issues that everybody else in the world is going to face. The psalmist says it this way. Uh, David says in Psalm, the 37th Psalm, verse, 27, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, so God directs your steps and God directs your path. And when you walk in the path that God sets for you, God is delighted in the way that you're walking. And David does not say that that path is going to be easy. And he does not say that that path is going to come without trouble. Now, he says, more perfect 
me in verse 24, though he fall. You see that? You are going to walk in the path that God lays out, and it's possible for you to fall. So, though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. And that's a comfort that comes to us, even as we find ourselves in uh, treacherous times today. Yeah, we can fall, we can have setbacks, we can have trouble, we can have sickness, but we have to trust and have faith that God is going to uphold us. He says in verse 25, I have been young and now I am old, and yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. The scripture goes on. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. So Paul here is encouraging us to be strong and don't give up the fight. Don't faint, he says. In verse 7, he says, We have this treasure in earth and vessel, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us ourselves. So leave room in your life for God to work and show his strength and power. We are troubled on every side. You see that? You see, we can be for God and we can, we can be in God and we can have the power of God and still be troubled. We are troubled on every side, but not distressed. Yeah, we are perplexed. There are some things in life we just don't understand. We can't claim to understand. Yes, we are perplexed. So, yeah, it's just as natural not to understand, but the Bible says we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but God has not forsaken us. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. And we ought to look at that and say, yeah, I have setbacks, I have trouble, I have bills, God, I have them. But you know what? I'm still here. And sometimes that, that has to be the thing that we glory in. It's the fact that no matter what happens, no matter what comes, I'm still here. Always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Elisha, as he's meeting this woman, she comes to him and she's telling him her troubles. And Elisha says to her, verse 2, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, Your handmaid has nothing in my house except a pot of oil. And we, we read that in the original language. She actually says, I, I only have a little cruise. I have a little bit of oil, just enough for the anointing, as it were. And so Elisha then is going to press her beyond her imagination. And if I could do that for you today, I would impress you, impress that upon you, to press you beyond your imagination. Because we look at our circumstance, and when we look at our circumstance, we often fail to consider what's really at our disposal. In doctrinal point number one, God starts to bless you with what's in your possession. God starts to bless you, doctrinal point number two, with what's in your possession. Elisha says to the woman, look in your house to see what you have. And many of us, if we are honest, we'd say that we have many things at our disposal that we've not always seen as meet or acceptable for what we're going through. I, I know oftentimes I I'll sit in the house and I'll say, I'm hungry. Amen. And, and uh, I'll say, I don't have anything to eat. I, I wonder what I'm going to eat. And immediately, in time past, I start to think about restaurants that are in close proximity to my house. You know something God did for me? He showed me once just how much of a liar I was. 
Amen. Because when I went and looked in my freezer, there's plenty of food in the freezer. When I look in the refrigerator, there's plenty of food in the refrigerator. When I look in the cabinets, I have plenty of food in the cabinet. And then I have to reassess and say, oh, it's not that I don't have anything to eat. I just don't want that. Well, now, we would take assessment of our lives in that way. And instead of saying, well, the problem lies with me, we'll say the problem lies with God. No. And the problem is not with God. The problem is with us. It's with our desires and the way we see our lives. Well, God starts to bless you with what's in your possession. Here's an example in Exodus chapter 4. Uh, God comes to Moses and verse 1, he, and he's telling Moses that you're going to go and I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. And Moses does what we do. Is Moses starts to look at himself and lay his apprehension about himself at the feet of God. And then God says to him, verse 2, the Lord said, what is in your hand? And Moses says, a rod. And what goes on, or what, what we see that takes place in the, the remaining part of that scripture is God is showing Moses that everything you need to accomplish what I'm sending you to do is already in your hand. We see this a little more in Exodus chapter 14. The Lord says to Moses, verse 15, why are you crying to me? Amen. That's for those of us that are prone to prayer. And that's a good thing. Pray to God and continue to pray. But there comes a time when God says, you just need to stop crying to me about the things you're crying to me about. Because the power to relieve your situation is at your disposal and sometimes it's in your hand. So he says, speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. Verse 16, but lift up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea. Divide it. The children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 12 says this, For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he does not have. So what are you saying, Paul? Paul would have us to understand that God is in the business of working with us and dealing with us exactly where we are and starting with what we already have. God is good that way. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 3. The writer goes on and says, Then he said, Elisha says to this woman, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. Elisha is stepping on some of our toes because some of us don't like to ask anybody for anything. I'm, 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 I'm independent. I'm self-sufficient. And sometimes God brings us to the point where he has to break down our pride. Sometimes God says, you have not because you ask not. Amen. And sometimes we like to go to God and say, well, I ask God, I ask God, I ask God. And sometimes God is saying to you, good, go ask your brother. Yeah, you can have it, but you're going to get it from your sister. Yeah, you can have it, but you're going to get it from your mother. So the writer, or Elisha, says to her, go Put yourself in this position and borrow of uh, your neighbors. Uh, even as we are in this pandemic, I don't, I don't know about you, but I've had to get to know my neighbors a little better. Yeah, God can fix that so that now you actually have to talk to your neighbor. You actually have to find out their name. You actually have to find out where they're from and how they came to be 
see your neighbor. Yeah, there's some good that can come out of the worst situations in your life. So uh, he says, go to your neighbors, borrow vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Doctrinal point number three. God will bless you, and sometimes that blessing comes at the hand of others. God charges others to bless you, and some of us, if you be honest, God is charging you to bless somebody. God is putting in your hands, in your grasp, the ability to be able to help somebody other than yourself. I love the writing in the Philippian letter because the Philippian writer says that every man should look to the needs of others. And I tell you, it's so difficult. It's, it's easy to look at myself and it's easy to think about me, me, me. And here, the scripture is showing us that no man is an island to himself. Every man is a part of the whole. It's an old saying by John Don. And John says, so when you hear the bell toll, uh, ask not for who the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. What is John saying? John is saying, we are all interrelated. And that's one thing, glory to God, and thank God that this pandemic has shown us, is that we all are the same. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Spanish, whether you're in Augusta, whether you're in Georgia, whether you're in Texas, whether you're in China, we all are interrelated. Sometimes it takes something as simple as sickness. It takes something as simple as disease. It takes something as simple as economic disruption to show us just how interrelated we truly are. God will bless you, and God will bless you at the hands of others. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 3. We see this with verse 20. God is talking to the children of Israel, and he says to the children of Israel, I'm going to bring you out, and I'm going to take you into a new land. I'm going to stretch out my hand. I'm going to smite Egypt with wonders. And in verse 21, I'm going to give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it's going to come to pass that when you go, you shall not go out empty. But every man shall borrow of her neighbor and her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver, silver and gold and raiment. And you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters and you shall spoil the Egyptians. I love the way that Isaiah says this. And this is for all of the people who wrestle with welfare, who, we who wrestle with social programs. God has always been a God of social justice. God has always been a God that wants his people to look out for one another and to help the less fortunate. How do you know that, preacher? Well, the scripture says here, Isaiah heralds the word in Isaiah 55, he says, Oh, everyone that's thirsty, come to the waters. And he that has no money, come you. Buy and eat. Wait, Isaiah, you said he had no money. How can he buy if he doesn't have money? Yes, it, it, it's this idea that he's going to come. You know he's hungry. You know he's thirsty. And those who have need to take care of those who do not. Yeah, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. The reason I know you can afford it because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so when God distributes, God is able to say, I can give it to you and I can give it to you freely. Wherefore, why? Why do you spend your money for that which is 
not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy you. Hearken diligently unto me, saith the Lord, and eat ye that which is good, and, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Back in 2 Kings, verse 5 says, So she went from him. She shut the door upon her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. I love that phrase. That not only does God provide and the oil stay, that God is able to bless us when we're looking around and think we have nothing. And God can work with nothing. And God can sustain us even though we have nothing. And so, doctrine point number four, God blesses with abundance. I love the way God blesses. I love the way God blesses. Because God blesses me like nobody else can. I love it when I get something and I know I got it from God. Because when God gives me something, no man can take it away. Amen. I'm so thankful that, and when I pray for blessing, I pray for blessing from God. Because God will pour and he'll pour and he'll pour and he'll pour and he'll pour, and he'll pour until I can't contain anymore. And when God blesses you that way, when God pours into you that way, it's not his intention that you look around and say, I have so much stuff, I think I'll hoard and get more. No, no. God blesses me so that I can be a blessing. And God blesses you so that you may be a blessing. Otherwise, what's the purpose of a blessing? If God hasn't blessed you, watch this, this is dangerous. If God hasn't blessed you so that you can bless someone else, if God has blessed you truly for you to just gather and build up storehouses and hoard everything that comes in your possession, if God has not blessed you so that you can share the bountifulness of his blessing and the bountifulness of his grace, then maybe God hasn't blessed you. Maybe he's cursed you. Yeah, maybe he hasn't blessed you. Maybe he's set you up. The scripture says concerning Pharaoh, God says concerning Pharaoh, for this cause, I raised you up. Pharaoh, I gave you all the kingdoms of the land. I made you the most powerful ruler in the world just so I could knock you down. It's dangerous. We don't want to be on that side of God's wrath. We don't want to be on that side of God's aim. So yeah, God blesses and he blesses in abundance, but he blesses so that you might be a blessing. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says this, Bring all of the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now. God says, try me and prove me herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough for you to receive it. God says, I can bless you and I can bless you in a way that you won't even be able to contain the blessing. Even in a pandemic, even in the midst of sickness, even in the midst of despair, somebody out there can say amen. Because while people are running around the stores and people are in panic, there are some people under the sound of my voice right now today, you've never missed a meal. While there are some people who haven't, who haven't worked and, and, and they don't know when they're going back to work, there are some who are under the sound of my voice today, you report it to work every day. Yeah, there are some that God is blessing while others are in 
despair. And why is he doing this? So that we can be a blessing to others. So, what should we do? This great lesson from Elisha. How do we apply this to our lives? Look to God. Look to God for peace. There are many who are wrestling today, and the truth of the matter is, they just don't have peace. Peace comes from God. Peace is something that can be found in a God that is described as the God of peace. Look to God for comfort. We, we can find comfort in the God of our salvation, for he's the only one who can stay the ills and the worries of our heart. Look to God for hope. There are some who have helplessness and hopelessness, but the greatest hope for mankind lies in the finished work of God. And God is able to give us hope in every situation of our life, even when it seems as if the only thing that is left is hopelessness. And look to God for blessing. No one can bless you like God can. No one can secure your heart like God can. No one can, can guide your feet through the path that we call life like God can. So look to God for each and every thing that you encounter in your life.